So uh, the way I wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad was my wife Kim and I had a goal. And our goal was to be f retired in 10 years. You know how people wait till they're 65 or 70 to retire? Our, my goal was to retire in 10. So that means without a job and without a 401k, without IRAs and all that. So we did it by being entrepreneurs and investors in real estate. So I retired at 47, Kim was retired at 37. And once we had done that, I went down to Bisbee, Arizona, which is the most beautiful little town in Arizona, I believe. It's an old, old mining town. You don't need air conditioning in Bisbee, even in the summertime, because the weather is perfect. It's the most perfect weather in America. So I'm out there, I'm building a little house because I want to learn how to be a builder. I bought a stagecoach depot and converted it into a house. So it was a stagecoach depot that ran between Tombstone, Arizona and Bisbee, Arizona, and saw us out there working. And at night, there was no television, no radio, so isolated. So I sat there just writing away my little computer, and that's where Rich Dad, Poor Dad came from. So there was, so we, we created the, Kim and I created the cash flow board game, and the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book came out, this book came out in 1997. And I, I, took, I shopped it to all the publishers in New York City, and they all had reject it, reject, reject, reject. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, because I, I don't have stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. I don't have any of that. I don't have a retirement plan. I don't need a job. I don't like the stock market. And I like real estate. I make a lot of money. I don't pay taxes legally. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. So this book was rejected, and so finally, I called my friend in Austin, Texas, and he had a car wash. So I said, would you mind putting this book inside your car wash for sale? He says, we don't sell books in car washes. And um, I said, well, that's good. There's no competition for my book. He says, you put it in there, two weeks. If it's not gone, you get it back. I said, got a deal. So I sent him, I think, about two dozen of these books and they sat there. So I'd call him up. He says, they're still here. I said, don't, just take your time, take your time. And then one day, he, he says, they're gone. Somebody bought them. I said, somebody bought them? And he says, yeah. I said, well, who bought it? He says, I don't know. Somebody just bought it. They're all gone, all 20, 24 of them, let's say. I went, holy mackerel. And then about... A month later, I got a phone call from this guy named, he says, from Dallas, Texas. He goes, hi, my name is Bill Galvin. Yeah, I said, I read your book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I said, oh, did you buy it? He said, no, my friend bought it for me. I said, okay. Dr. Tom Burns. I said, okay. And he said, uh, it's a good book. How many books you got? And I, Kim and I had printed 1,000. And um, how many you got left? I said, 1,000 minus 24. <laughs> He says, I'll take the rest of them. And I said, who are you? He says, I'm with Amway. So he's a diamond with Amway. So he took all the books and they sent it out throughout the world. And that's how Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I mean, by in two, two years, he was on the New York Times bestseller list, even though it was self-published, which they, they, New York Times is, a, you know, they're, they're not the most, conservative organization but because I because I wasn't from the academic world they didn't like it that my book was number one sitting up there and self-published so my first business was a nylon and velcro surfer wallet business and um, it didn't sell so you know everybody knows what those wallets are today but back then this was 1974 or 5 yeah 75 they didn't know what the wallets were so we were going broke really fast. Mm -hmm. We bought 100,000 of these wallets from Korea. We shipped it to our warehouse in Long Island and we were borrowing money from our investors. So we raised about $600,000 to get this little goofy wallet business up. So I was in, we were in serious trouble. I owed my father about $200,000. My rich dad was laughing at me. We were going broke so quickly because we couldn't move the wallets, 100,000 of them. They were sitting in this bonded warehouse on Long Island and nobody would buy them from us. So then, the good thing about stupidity 
There it is. Makes you smarter. So I started thinking. We started thinking. I said, what's wrong? And I said, what was happening in the world at that time? All the baby boomers were fat, so they had to start running. So jogging was coming online. You know, and nobody jogged before, because, mm -hmm. you know, so these guys are all jogging. And then we're reading the paper. We're sitting in Honolulu going broke fast. And we're reading the paper. This jogger went to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and was jogging around the park. And what the jogger did was he had no place to put his car key. So what did they do? He puts it on the front tire of his car and goes for a jog around the park. So we're reading this newspaper. And voila, when he comes back to his car, the car wasn't there. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so the guy says, they stole my car. Oh, my goodness. And so the question was, on the headline of the newspaper article, mm -hmm. what does a jogger do with their key? Mm -hmm. And so we sat there and said, oh, my God, a problem, a problem. So with that, I designed the shoe pocket. And you can see this picture right here. It's Playboy magazine. I mean, she's a nice looking young model with nothing on but a shoe pocket. <laughs> but anyway, so we were going broke so fast by then. But when that picture hit Playboy, mm -hmm. suddenly we were geniuses. And everybody started throwing their money at us. And all these products. Our wallets were selling, our shoe pockets were selling, investors were happy, and the sales went through the roof. So we were extremely successful. So we went from risk, stupid, smarter, mm -hmm. successful. But the problem was is how do we finance our inventory? Because the demand was worldwide, and we couldn't keep up with demand. So I borrowed another $100,000. And I went to my CPA, my, my CFO, Stanley. So I said, Stanley, will this $100,000 solve our inventory problem? He goes, yes, it will. So I gave Stanley the check, and he ran off with it. Oh, my goodness. I had no signed documentation. I turned it over to him. He said, I owed him the money. So that was one of my first, you know, six-figure, seven-figure mistakes. <sighs> How do you increase income? And you've got to sell. You know, sales equals income. Yeah. And it's, if you don't have income, it's because you can't sell. It's just that directly. So there's two things I'll just say. My, my best friend and I, we became best friends at Xerox. He was number one in office products, and I was, my, I was number one in copiers. Mm -hmm. And this was a secret to our success. We outworked the other guys. So one thing that we both did is Larry and I, and he, he's a mega, mega real estate developer today. Mega. Mm -hmm. You know, thousands and thousands wow. and thousands and thousands of rental units. Wow. Huge fund, you know. But we both started work on Sunday night. And so well, why would you do that? I said, well, because we parted Friday and Saturday. <laughs> We're hungover on Sunday, and we start work on Sunday <laughs> night. And we would get all our, you know, we, we, we had it all set up. So on Sunday, we did all our proposals for the next <laughs> sales and all this stuff. So Monday morning came while well, the other guys were sitting at the coffee shop drinking coffee, complaining about the economy, yeah. bitching about the <laughs> boss, you know. My friend Larry and I hit the road running. And by Wednesday, we'd done everything. Oh, wow. we made our sales calls and our presentations. We knew we were ahead of the game. So that was number one. The other thing we both did is we volunteered for charity. So when other guys were going home, like on Friday, af Monday afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, and all this, we went to these charities and we dialed for dollars. So we'd say, hi, we're calling from this Red Cross or mm -hmm. animal shelters. So we volunteered to sell for charities, again, the spiritual side. So for about from like seven to nine, one or two days a week, we'd be on the phone dialing for dollars. Now you can say, well, that's generous of you. It wasn't generous. This is why we're successful. During the day, we were lucky if we made two sales calls. By making phone calls at night, dialing for dollars, we could make 10, 20 calls a night. Mm. So the more calls we made, the more failures we had, and the more money we made. Yeah. So we would make all these phone calls at night, failing away, but we're more effective during the day. So all these people say, well, you shouldn't make mistakes and all that. 
the more we failed making phone calls, the better we got. Yeah. And after a while, I didn't care if I got rejected or this, and I'd say, hello, I'm calling for this. And you know, one was the Red Cross we dialed for. I called for the Red, we don't want it. I said, look, please listen to me. I don't want to donate. I said, please, you know, I'd mm -hmm. handle the BS. That I'm dialing for a good purpose. I'm dialing for the Red Cross. Yeah. And, and pretty soon, I said, okay, I'll give you the money. <laughs> so I do that at night. And I could do that 10, mm -hmm. 20 times a night. During Incredible. the day, I made more money. Wow. So anyway, that's, yeah. that was the secret of our success. We yeah. failed one of the other guys. So this is the diagram, a simple sketch of the cash flow quadrant. So when I was a young boy, my rich dad would just show this here. E stands for employee. S stands for self-employed, small business, or specialist, like a doctor or a lawyer, computer programmer. And S can do their job on their own. That's the difference. If you can do your job on your own, you're an S. If you need a job, you're an E. That's the difference here. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more, or I stands for inside investor. See, these guys, when they invest in the stock market, they're outsiders. When I invest, I want to be an insider. So the people with their retirement plans and all that, guys who invest with Warren Buffett, they're outsiders. I wanted to be an insider. So this is the big difference between thoughts and how you change. This here is poor dad. The words in his head were go to school, get a job, get a paycheck and a retirement plan. And this was my poor mom. She wanted me to be a doctor. The problem was I kept flunking out of school. It's not very smart. And over here was my rich dad. So if you're gonna change your thoughts, how do you change? You may wanna consider making your changes here. This one is the hardest by far the hardest, but they are the richest. They are the richest people on the earth. You know, like today, Steve Jobs, who dropped out of school, Apple just went to $2 trillion. He didn't finish school. Michael Dell didn't finish school. Zuckerberg didn't finish school. Walt Disney did not finish school. This is the hardest quadrant here. B stands for 500 employees or more, but also stands for the word brand. Apple is a brand. Disneyland is a brand. Tesla is a brand. Rich Dad is a brand. These guys, they want everything in their names, like Joe's Fish Company. It cannot explain. You cannot, it's hard to explain if you're the worker. Again, an S can do their job on their own. These guys cannot. What I say to people is this, it's not how much money you make, which I cover in fake, it's what you do with the money. Mm -hmm. See, in, in fake, I write about, the same thing I wrote about in Rich Dad, is that I follow the McDonald's system of business. McDonald's is not in the hamburger business. McDonald's is in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. So that's how McDonald's, you, you can buy a McDonald's, you can buy the most expensive real estate in any city in the world is a McDonald's franchise, because they produce so much money. Yeah. So McDonald's, a McDonald's business buys the real estate. This building here, my, my company, we're buying real estate. Yeah. And we buy gold and silver. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We are entrepreneurs because we're investors, not because we're entrepreneurs. It's brilliant. Because I want to generate as much money as possible to invest. So the average guy says, oh, you know, I'm making 100,000 a year, but I don't make enough money. Well, the reason is because you're paying taxes. Yeah. You know, if you get a job, you'll pay taxes because debt and taxes is how the dollar becomes money.